Spokane Gary was probably born about the year 1811 by an interesting coincidence. That's really the first time we have a completely fully documented incursion of a European into this region and the man's name was David Thompson. I think most of you have heard of him. Thompson was probably, well I'd say he's certainly regarded as the most important original explorer of this region. He's not a missionary. We're some 25 years ahead of this missionary influx, but I feel justified in talking about David Thompson because really the story properly begins here, except for the legend that I've already told you, which would predate even David Thompson's involvement here. But David Thompson I want to talk about a little bit because he was a Christian, and though not a missionary, he was certainly completely filled with his faith and a vision of faith as he did the labors that made him so famous in the Pacific Northwest. So David Thompson, this is kind of a pencil sketch that represents an attempt based on descriptions of him to give what his appearance was likely about the age 20, 21 or so when his story in some ways picks up. He was born in England to Welsh migrants. He was born into fairly significant poverty, and to make matters worse, his father died when he was but two years old. And so from that point on, the entire family was just virtually at the edge. Every penny was valuable to them as they just tried to scrape by. Finally, when David was seven years old, his mother, for lack of any better alternatives, dropped him off at a Christian school, which was a charitable school intended for people who couldn't afford an education otherwise. And so this was part of the Christian ministry at that time in England. And so he enrolled in this school, and it was a boarding school as well. So he was cared for for the next seven years at a school that was called the Gray Coat Charity School. During the time there, he was a student of the scripture himself. It was indeed a Christian school, and by every account, including his own extensive journals that we have available, he fully embraced the Christian faith. He was a Christian, and that was never any secret to those who knew him, and it was part of the very inspiration of his life, even as a child. And so this commitment he made to Christ was very much a defining aspect of his ongoing career. But aside from that, he also displayed extraordinary gifts in mathematics. He was a quick student and went way ahead of his peers and really developed quite a bit of uh, expertise in dealing with what was then considered higher mathematical skills and so on. When David was 14 years old, the representatives of the Hudson's Bay Company came through town. This they did routinely because they were always looking for bright students who would be willing to join an apprenticeship with the Hudson's Bay Company. And so they came to the headmaster of this school and said, hey, you got any good candidates in your school? And immediately the headmaster thought of David Thompson. He was probably of all the students there, the one who would seem to be the most appropriate for such a nomination, and indeed that's exactly what happened. So David Thompson, at 14 years of age, became an apprentice with the Hudson Bay Company, and that necessitated that he leave England and travel once for all forever to the New World, and he arrived at the Hudson's Bay a few weeks later. There's a note in his journals. He kept meticulous notes even as a young teenager. And there's a note written when he's 14 years old concerning seeing the ship depart that had brought him to the new world. And he writes as follows, while the ship was at anchor, my parent and friends, it appeared only a few weeks distance. But when the ship sailed, and from the top of the rocks I lost sight of her, the distance became immeasurably or immeasurable, and I bid a long and sad farewell to my country and exile forever. So you can tell at least at that moment in his life there was a lot of mixed emotions about seeing the last contact with his homeland sailing off, going off the horizon, and that was that. He was 14 years old. This was in September and he was standing on the shore of the Hudson's Bay at Churchill Factory. 
The Hudson's Bay Company, just to remind you of your high school American history. <laughs> it's all there, isn't it? The Hudson's Bay Company was founded 100 years earlier under Charles II. We talked about Charles II last year. He was not a friend of Protestant Christianity, but some good things happened under his reign, one of which was establishing this company. The Hudson's Bay Company is, my friends, the oldest commercial operation in America. And some of you, I bet, are wearing clothing from the Hudson's Bay Company right now. So it's still going, still a, a going concern. Originally, the Hudson's Bay Company operated on the uh, basis of, of trade. So they brought what amounted to pretty common goods from England and they brought them over and traded them for much, much more valuable fur pelts and so on that were given to them by the Native Americans. So this trade became extremely lucrative. I'm not saying it was unfair because the natives were happy to receive the blankets and other, you know, kind of European trinkets and so on. But from the point of view of Hudson's Bay Company, this was a very lucrative operation. And so originally, the Hudson's Bay Company was a trading company, but eventually they figured out they could actually do better if they had their own trappers who would go out and do the original work without uh, de depending so much on trade. And so that began to take place, and, and over time it became not just a trading company, but a trapping company as well. There was a competing company that was formed in 1779, about 100 years later, called the Northwest Company. I'm mentioning this because it actually matters. So you want to uh, keep an eye on both of these. Both companies were in play now, but the Northwest Company comes in a little bit later. So those are the two sort of economic forces that are the background for our story. Uh, David Thompson himself was a smart, resourceful leader, and even in his mid-teenage years, 16, 17 years old, he already had such leadership skills that he was assigned a small band of men, who, some of whom were actually quite a bit older than he was, but he had this kind of wit and savvy and uh, resourcefulness that made him a natural leader. And so already, even as an apprentice, he was beginning to distinguish himself in ways that were somewhat unusual. At one point, he wintered in a, at a trading post which was immediately adjacent to a village of Blackfoot Indians and in three months he mastered their language so he not only had mathematical skills he was a genius and he picked up this language rapidly and that began to distinguish him in the minds of his employers as someone that might be able to be of great use to them in the future so his ability to pick up languages certainly was part of what continued to drive him all the way through and give him the kind of success that he had, especially dealing with the native population. He was also, however, a young man, and you know how young men can be, uh, a little bit too adventurous, and on one occasion, on one of his adventures, he fell into a deep crevasse and fractured his leg in multiple places. It was a horrific injury. There was some question whether he would lose his leg. There was certainly question whether he'd ever walk again. It took full, fully two years for him to convalesce. And he never did fully regain the use of the leg. He always walked with a conspicuous limp uh, throughout the rest of his career. But the two years that he spent in this convalescence in a, in a, at a trading post, basically, there was a surveyor who was employed by the Hudson's Bay Company who took a notice of David Thompson and noticed especially his giftedness in mathematics. The man's name was Philip Turner. And so, as it turns out, even though he was impaired and in fact laid up, David Thompson, for the next two years, was given one of the most prestigious educations in surveying that anybody could receive from a master surveyor, Philip Turner. So actually, this became, in a sense, graduate school while he was recovering with this broken leg. And at the end of that time, he was fully committed to being a surveyor. This was what he wanted to do when he grew up. He fell in love with the whole discipline of being a surveyor. At the end of his apprenticeship, which was in 1791, when he was 21 years of age, usually guys that finished an apprenticeship would ask for some kind of frivolous, expensive gift, like brand new clothes or you know, something like that. And what, uh, what David Thompson asked for was state-of-the-art survey equipment. That's what he wanted. That was the gift he was after. And he was given that, and it, it became the tools of his trade for the next, really, for the rest of his career. 
He used his uh, survey equipment so uh, constantly that he actually burned out the retina in his right eye from looking too much at the sun. Uh, and so again, uh, he had to learn some lessons the hard way. So David Thompson, for his remarkable career, walked with a limp and was blind in one eye, but that didn't slow him down a whole lot. He wanted to be a surveyor. The mathematical requirements, the kind of meticulous and detailed measurements, the triangulating locations and so on, this was what filled his imagination. And he wanted to do it in this vast frontier that we would commonly call Canada and parts of North America. But the Hudson's Bay Company was saying, hey kid, you know, we know you've got some ability as a surveyor, but actually we make more money on you if you're just a trapper. So we want you to go out and trap beavers and you know, make money that way, and maybe someday you can become a surveyor. Well, this conflict became so acute that finally in 1797, David Thompson bolted and abandoned the Hudson Bay Company and joined the Northwest Company, which was perfectly happy to employ him as a surveyor. And so that took place, and that's the more common picture of him you'll see in which he's holding his survey equipment. And that became the defining uh, sort of uh, career of David Thompson from that point on. He wrote in his journal on May 23rd, 1797, quote, this day I left the service of the Hudson's Bay Company and entered that of a company of merchants from Canada. May God Almighty prosper me. He fills his journals with prayers like that. And some are touching to say the least. The people that he joins up with, with the Hudson's Bay Company, are what came to be called mountain men. And they were kind of a rough bunch. One commentator described them as, quote, a colorful group of scrappy British fur traders and buckskinned French Canadians, experts at paddling canoes on raging rivers and transporting supplies to remote places. So they were savvy in the wilderness but their style of life probably was at least somewhat less than what a Christian conscience would easily tolerate, you know. And so David Thompson found himself in this interesting, somewhat tense relationship with people that in some ways he was actually leading. Be that as it may, he was hired to explore and map new wraps, uh, ra routes rather, and open trade uh, between the East and the West. I'm not going to give details of this very interesting story that I'm just going to kind of touch on very briefly, but about the next 10 years of his career, he's working North America, especially the Canadian side, and it was essentially a blank. You know, it was just a big blank uh, piece of paper, and he created the map. The map was so precise, so detailed, that it actually was author considered authoritative until well into the 20th century. He checked and rechecked his work. He was a meticulous scientist, and when he applied his craft in this particular area, the quality of what he produced uh, has been universally recognized as the, really the finest of the time. And so he made a huge almost unspeakably valuable contribution, not only to the fur trade, which almost became the lesser concern, but to the entire question of what is this vast area in which we have found ourselves and uh, what does it look like? The Indians called him Cucusent, which simply means man who watches the stars, you know, because he spent so much time looking at the heavenly uh, bodies to uh, assess his position. About 10 years later, this is now 1806, the Lewis and Clark expedition has just taken place. The Louisiana Purchase, 1803, and then, you know, what's out there in them are hills. So Lewis and Clark take off, 1804 through 1806, and actually define a route, the Lewis and Clark Trail, you know, the original kind of route across the country, and the Northwest Company, realizing that they could lose some commercial advantage, said to uh, David Thompson, we want you to do the same thing, son. So David Thompson, in a sense, is the Canadian version of Lewis and Clark. And he had been mapping more or less the eastern part of Canada, and now the job was to go across the Rockies and do something like that out in the west.